That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why, but uh, I, might, I might tempt fate a bit later in the call, but uh, at the moment I know he's listening, so that's pretty good. Um, yeah, so we've got a few few not here today, but uh, it's all right. Um, I think as, as the group gets smaller, we'll just get more specific and, and really sort of go into the individual areas where people are sort of looking for help, guidance. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant. So we'll start with you, Andrew. We'll do a quick whiffle and uh, I'll see if we can get Matt on the line and cross our fingers. So you can go up first. Okay, yeah. Um, well, what I'm feeling about for the moment, I just got the um, audio from... Uh, Grant Cardone, the 10x video um, audio, which is uh, pretty inspiring. So I'm enjoying that, um, and uh, yeah, things are going pretty well. I'm just I'm going back back over my uh, the sales process, trying to refine that. I realised that I've missed a couple of steps, and I wanted to add to a bit more. So working on that, I've worked on my scripts, um, and uh, yeah, still developing the uh, uh, budget and uh, some of the action plan. Yeah, excellent. Very good. All right, I'm going to attempt to get Matt on the call. Uh, Matt, here we go. So all or nothing. Matt, can you hear me? There, Matt. Ah, well, I can hear you, and we haven't disconnected. We, I think we just did. <laughs> all right, let's forget about that. So Matt will come back in. Yeah, all right. So it's you and me, Andrew, and Matt's going to... He's dropped out again. <laughs> um, oh, really? Yeah, so, but he'll probably just try and clog back in. So, I'm not sure what to do with that. Technology kills us. Um, I'll move. Just say, I'll have to move. No, no, I'm, I'll move. It's all right. Um, just be with me a sec, um, David. Yeah. I'm going to have to move. Yeah, no, no problem. All right. Um, I don't know if Andrew's there or not. I seem to have lost him. So. I think technology's got the better of us. Oh, there he is. You there, Andrew? All right, I'm back. Yep. yep. Sorry, I had to move offices. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. You good to go? Yep, I am. It looks like it's you and me and Matt bouncing in and out, so... Um, oh, he's, still, he's having a few technology issues, isn't he? I don't know what it is. Cause he, if he, he says I log in and as soon as you unmute me, I, I get hung up. So he's just going to be a voyeur for the session. But um, I suppose computer. So um, anyway, my, my whiffle, what I feel like expressing is, uh, you know, we're about to move office at the end of the week. So I'm pretty focused on that. Yeah, and good. we've got uh, three more sessions of this, I think. Uh, so I just want to really tune in because this was a bit of an experiment on my part, just to seeing whether we can actually do sales coaching over a period of time. Um, we've covered a lot of the major components, so now I'm really just sort of looking for feedback from you or any of the other guys as to what they think is relevant. So that's what I feel expressing. 
Um, I've been looking through your forecast. It's looking pretty good. I uh, just had a quick look through your calendar. And that looks pretty good too. So you started sort of setting some activity KPIs. Yes, yeah. Just yep. to um, try and back up well to feed in for into the um, back into the uh, the budget forecast that shows the activities I've sort of identified. Yeah. Um, the the only thing I've seen that uh, additional to what you've done that seems to work really well is some people use a point system. Where they oh, have yes, those, yep. Yeah, so all those activities, cold calling, uh, doing proposals, presentations, each one of them, they, they sort of attribute a number of points to. And that way, yep. because it's sort of difficult to sort of have a stream of cold calls where you say, I'm going to do five every day. But you might say, well, cold calling is worth three points. And, you know, responding to an email request is worth five points and a presentation is worth 10 points. And, and you can sort of use your own initiative to work out what's the most valuable use of your time. Yeah, sure. And using that sort of methodology, you can you can really sort of start thinking about what activities you need to be doing. Yep, I actually pinched that uh, the, the show, well copy the sheet from um, uh, Tom Hopkins. Okay. He had a he's got a uh, he had an activity sheet so and he's got the points down so I might use that as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just like the whole, the whole notion here is like as a sales rep, there's so many things you can you can do. Um, if you don't really focus in on the key ones, you, you can just end up being really busy but not productive. Yes. Yeah. So, so definitely, well. I think I've fallen into that trap at the moment. I'm not looking at um, not doing enough uh, call, outbound calling. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so really, where where you at with things at the moment? Like, if we were to look at your sales sales process or sales activity at the moment, what areas do you think there's some gaps or there need needs attention? Um. In terms, well, I'll, I guess some, uh, I need to ramp up. Well, I'll do a little bit of um, marketing in terms of. Um, I've got some case studies, and now I need to get to do some mail outs and some cold calling. Yep. To try and generate some um, some meetings and interviews or you know, appointments. Okay. So, have you got a specific target market that you're chasing? Like, is there an area um, or is there an industry? Yes. At the moment, it's going to be um, medical centres and aged care, aged care slash retirement villages. Okay. Okay, and potentially and um, regional, private, or regional, non-government schools. Mm. Okay, so really, you've got a couple of sectors there that you can sort of dive into headlong. Have you got a database yeah. to work from? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Okay, is that something you'll the generate? Suggestions? Yeah. <laughs> there's a couple of different ways. Um, there's the pricey way, which is bringing a list broker and asking yep. them to give you a list. There's a sort of middle of the road way, which is basically jumping on Google and finding these people. Um, are you using LinkedIn at all? Uh, yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. So on LinkedIn, you can do a search based on industry and title. So what okay, you can do yeah. is you can find people through LinkedIn. Um, the other thing with LinkedIn is um, you can join groups. So what you do is you look for sort of discussion groups on, on different areas. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll find sort of groups around, like let's say, for example, uh, private hospitals might have a particular user group or some or something like that. Yep. So you can source data there. Um, you know, then then you can move into Google itself and just type in literally private healthcare, whatever the sector is, and and just start going through the Google search results. Um, if you know, uh, if you can define your sector well, you can almost outsource it as well where you, you actually jump on somewhere like um, Elance and you say, I'm looking for someone to compile a list of Victorian private hospitals and you'll find someone over in, in, in either Singapore or India, which will mm -hmm. jump online yep. for a few dollars. Like they'll do it for maybe 10 bucks an hour, five to 10 bucks an hour. And, and they'll basically screen scrape and put it into a spreadsheet for you. So, but there's, there's three or four different ways to do it. Just depends on, on how big you think the list is going to be. And how much time yep. do you think it'll take you? So, does that sort of make sense? Yep. Yeah. So, so, so that's, the, that's the simplest methodology for, for generating the list. So once we've got that list, um, would you do? Would you send mail out first, or would you make a phone call first? If you're not sure. Um, probably mail out first. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll try either. Mail's going to take a little while. Yeah. What, what I'll suggest is uh, there's a strategy that, that I used to use quite a bit is what's known as phone mail phone. 
right? Uh, and the objective of that is that if you send mail first, the, the real problem is does it get to the right person? Yes. Um, because it's easy to get a phone number for a building, but it's hard to get the right person who makes the decision. Person, yeah. 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 So you make an initial phone call and it's a pretty simple script. Um, you can do it yourself or you can pay a, a telemarketer to do. And all they're, all they're trying to do is find the right person to send information to. So yeah. it, it's basically seeking out the decision maker. Uh, in, in that sort of scenario, the, the script goes something along the lines of, you, you might call a private hospital in Bendigo, for example, and you'll get reception and you'll say, you know, hi, it's Andrew calling. I'm just looking for the person who's involved in charge of the facilities there. Uh, yeah. They might ask you what kind of facility. So you sort of drill a bit and they'll say, that would be Mary, I'll put you through. And if you get through to that person, you do your initial contact, you know, hi, Mary, it's Andrew. I'm, I'm calling in regard to you know, solar, electri solar electricity. And I just wanted to send some information through, would you be the best person to send it through to? And you can either start your sales conversation there, or my suggestion is usually to get their contact details and send info first. Yeah. It just gives you that ability to get sort of the, the number of touch points in. Now you can use email, you can use physical mail and really sort of, Depends on, on how you prefer to do it. But does that does that make sense? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a bit of a script script that I um that um, I've, um developed through listening to um uh, Jeffrey Gittimer for for do that, doing that same thing. Okay. Yep. So 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 one of, one of the things I learnt with that process is if you try and oversell on the first phone call, they'll just say no, not interested. Um, because yeah. they're just really saying don't bother me. So usually yes. what we try and do is minimize the amount of sale and just really focus in on, I just want to find the right person to send information to. Um, sure. So it just gives you that two-step approach where you can send it um, and then follow up the letter. Because I think yep. what, what we found with that sort of scenario was uh, if you make the first phone call, usually they're going, oh, God, another telemarketer, another person trying to sell me something. You say, look, we just want to send some info out and they go, yes, we got them off the phone. <laughs> And so uh -huh. they'll, they'll happily give you mail details. E email is probably less likely, but these days it's becoming more common. Yeah, no problem, send it through. And they have no intention of reading it at all. <laughs> it's just a way of getting yeah. off the phone. But what, what you've achieved out of that call is two things. You, you've made initial contact. You've, uh, you've uh, ascertained who the right um, decision maker is. And you've yeah. also, third thing you've done is you've made uh, a promise that you're going to deliver on. So you're sort of building credibility at a sort of low level. So what, what happens is when you ring back three days later, so that's what you'll do if you send out an email, um, and you say, hi, it's Andrew, can I speak to Mary? Uh, you're already going straight through the decision maker you're bypassing the gatekeeper. Uh, when you get yes. to Mary, first thing you say is, hi, it's Andrew, I spoke to you three days ago. So she links back to, okay, you're a person who's reliable. You've actually followed up, which is very rare these days. Um, and I'm just ringing to see that you received the info I sent you and, and you can sort of launch into your conversation from there. So, oh, yep. if that makes sense, it's a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit of extra steps in there, but what it does is it allows you to build rapport over a number of contacts. Yep. So, I've just known, like we used to call it the phone mail phone strategy. Um, we still do it to this very day because it allows us to not oversell. So you're not getting into that rejection mode. Um, yep. and it allows you to qualify and build a relationship over a few calls rather than just trying to do all in one hit. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, maybe put that down as a, a bit of homework for you to, to track, to, to sort of set up that as a bit of a flow of lead gen. Yep. Um, as far as identifying the target market and, and getting the list that, if it's only a list of 20 or 30, you, you might be able to just do it yourself. Yep. Because these days pretty quick, you just jump on Google and search out you know, whatever that target market is in that sort of vicinity and they'll just run off the list on the screen. Um, so it sort of depends which way you want to go. Has that been helpful? Yep. Right. What I might do is, is Ivan's jumped on the call, so I might just sort of switch over to him and I'll come back to you soon, Andrew. Cheers. All right. Ivan. Yeah, morning, Dave. Morning, how are you going? Yeah, good, thanks. And uh, and one to everyone else that's on, online. Yeah, sorry, uh, I did come a, a little bit late, thanks to the World Cup. Um, Germany's making an absolute thrashing out of Brazil. <laughs> ah, look, we wouldn't normally we give you that one, but uh, it's way below the line, but it's it's soccer, so <laughs> I'll let yeah, you have no, it. You can ignore it, come on. 
yeah. Uh, look, we, um, we've, only, we've only got a few people on the call today, so we're just really having a bit of a conversation on specific areas. But we might start with a quick check-in or a whiffle from you just to see where you're at with things. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I've certainly uh, updated my, um, uh, tool, my sales plan, uh, which I've sent you a copy of. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, things have just been busy in general, but um, I'm always thinking about, um, I guess, how we can, how I can refine the sales plan. and. Um, I yeah, watched a few videos also. Uh, I mean, obviously the ones that you'll send through uh, by Jeffrey Gittimer. Yep. But um, there's another interesting chap that I came across. That's Grant Cardin. Sorry, Grant. Uh, Cardin? Carver. Cardin. So uh, as in uh, the word car and done put together. Oh, so Grant I'm going to just send you uh, a link because there's, uh, there's, one, there's one particularly uh, good one where um, he takes over from a, a sales clerk and goes in and basically shows him how it's done. But mm -hmm. I think the way he um, he approached the scenario uh, and and the questioning that he throws at the customer was uh, was a pretty good one. Although it was quite direct. Okay. Um, I, might, I might share that with you, and you can probably distribute that, that out to uh, everyone else. Yeah, well, look, uh, anything like that. If, if anyone if anyone else sort of finds anything interesting, just feel free to send it through. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think one of the things is. Uh, you know, I've I've got a view of the world. Uh, other people got a view of the world. I don't think anyone's right or wrong. I just think that it's nice to hear what other people do, um, especially with sales trainers. You'll find you resonate with someone, and uh, then you can run with their their content. Where with others, they sort of grate you. So please send them through, and and I'll try and share those as well. I know um, Andrew, you mentioned someone as well. If you want to send through his details, uh, I'll make sure they go out in the next email. So no, that sounds good. So, so what did you pick up out of that? Like, if we, if we were going to look for distinctions for yourself, what did you what did you take away? Oh no, I guess um, and I was all, uh, and listen. I guess from uh, what particularly impressed me about Grant in this particular one that I'll send through to you. Um, yeah, no, he just uh, he sort of got uh, quite direct. Uh, he sort of took over from a sales clerk that was sort of uh, uh, you know battling with a customer over the phone uh, around the edges. It was a sort of a situation where he was umming and ahhing, and he was going to call, call him in another month's time to see whether he'd made his mind up about a contract. Yeah, and, um, and and then he sort of just he took over and he sort of asked him just some fairly, uh, you know, direct uh, and pertinent questions in, in terms of you know, the, you know, who called, you know, did he call the the company or did the sales clerk call him? And in this scenario, um, the customer actually had a um, had a need for the service, uh, and for whatever reason he was struggling over the price. But the the, uh, the, the guy in question. Uh, really got him to look at it uh, from a different angle, and that was, you know, the whole uh, cost to the business, and um, you know, and rather than looking at it from a monthly payment point of view, and him sort of uh, finding it difficult to justify from a monthly point of view, he sort of tried to uh, illustrate it in the context of the company. Okay. Okay. So in terms really of his overall spend, what he was doing, um, you know, um, it, it, what he spent last last year as a budget, and then, um, you know, and then sort of put. The, the training, which it was actually um, selling training, sales training for his clients. Yep. Uh, sorry, for his own uh, employees, and, okay. and put that in the context of what he was trying to achieve as a business. I mean, he actually had a problem in his business, and he wasn't happy with the way his employees were functioning, and they needed training. Yet he was willing to put that off. Um, anyway, um, I just, I just, thought, I thought he'd done it well, and uh, just some of the, the questioning and the angles, particularly the questioning. I think that's what people. I think in, the, in our group will enjoy, yeah. you know, the ambience and the questioning he provides, and even the questioning way he finishes up the conversation. You know, although he, he comes across as fairly, fairly gung ho and American, uh, I think he's in the UK when he, 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 I think he's trying to do one of these. Um, um, oh, what's the guy? The the cook that goes around and abuses all the guys in the restaurant. Um, oh, Steph, no. I should, yeah, I know. Yeah, he's the chef. He goes in there and into a um, you know a defunct restaurant and then. Sort of um, goes in there and shows them how to um, restore their business. He's one of those sorts of characters. Okay, okay. So, so yeah, look, that sounds great. I mean, th this is the sort of thing you want to be doing. Is just uh, there's so much stuff on the internet now, really YouTube and 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 audio that you can just pick up. And sometimes, sometimes you'll just like there'll be one thing that he says, and you go, I like you how he handled that. And mm. the, more, the more you absorb yourself in it, the more it becomes a part of your sort of mode of operation. So, yeah, so Grant, in this case, he sort of there's a lot of scenarios that he uh, that he sort of uh, illustrates in these uh, uh, on the web. So yeah, I certainly encourage the guys to um, click through and look at all the different um, 
obviously little lectures that are on there, but also little scenarios that these guys have posted up. Yep, yep, fantastic. Very good. Um, let me ask you, we, we were just sort of drilling, I was just having a chat with Andrew about specific gaps in, in his sales sort of funnel or his sales process right now and what he needs to focus on. Um, what would you consider to be something or sort of an area that you're sort of focused in on or there's gaps? Mm, I, I've sort of uh, fallen back more in a, um, um, probably from, from a strategy point of view, sort of looking at what, the type of work that we're quoting uh, or asking to quote on. I mean, at the time I spend generating quotes, like I'll almost spend um, uh, you know, a, a week if not uh, two or three days literally just putting a, a quote together. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you sort of throw your hat into the ring, whether you're tendering, uh, you know, writing proposals. I, I try and avoid or try and make sure that I qualify for the, um, before I go off and write a proposal. Yep. Um, so I've sort of streamlined that process where I've got a, a, a quick quotation sheet. But the other thing is like just making sure that my success rate is, uh, is a little bit more, um, how can I say, it? I'm, I'm a bit more successful I guess. Okay. Um, because we do put a, quite a bit of effort into it. Okay, um, so this, this is really conversion from uh, proposal to sale? Yeah, no, I'm just finding, I guess in this tough economic, I, I guess I'm bl blaming the tough economic environment, but mm. yeah, we really are st struggling to convert. You know, people make the inquiry, they've got the need, and then suddenly, for whatever reason, given the price, and that need seems to vanish, or they look, they look for alternatives. Um, okay. And having said that, though, um, well, I, I am finding that some of these customers are sort of coming back uh, three or four months later. Yep. Yep. Now, now. So, um, okay. So, interesting area. So, we, really, what we're talking about here is that whole lot, that whole notion of where well, you've done your proposal, you've gone, you've gone to the meeting, you've presented, and you're trying to close, and and really, they're not closing at that point in time. Yeah, and and I am doing, I'm, I am trying to get the, um, you know, for example, get to the the, the decision maker. Yeah. Um, and in most cases, we do get the opportunity to present to, you know, someone like the engineering manager. Yep. Um, and um, but yeah, they, they they seem to really struggle. I guess it's just sort of knowing how your companies operate, you know, and the fact that they sort of have a capital budget, and if they haven't budgeted for it in the previous financial year, um, it will generally sit and wait to the next financial year. Otherwise, they've got to make um, mm. how can I say, um, you know, pull pull money out of another budget to to make make an engineering job happen. Okay. Okay. So so there's probably a couple of things in there. Uh, number one is. Mm. It, the nature of your business is one that I don't think people can be pressured into making a decision. It's it's not like buying a car. It's it's really a, a quite a planned purchase. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, so, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah they've, they've sort of got to put it in because it's testing and it's part of a, a test plan. Yeah. You know, if they haven't done that correctly up front, which most of the time when they when they come to us, they haven't. Yeah. So th this yeah. Is, all, all you can do in those sorts of scenarios is. Um, your, your questions at the start need to sort of revolve around delivery dates, uh, priorities, uh, projects, budgeting, all those sorts of things. Now, uh, inevitably, if someone doesn't have a budget till next year and they're asking you to do a proposal, uh, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, this is the thing we go in there because well, what we do is we hope that you know, and, and we try. I try and certainly illustrate that you know, hey, this is something that um, you know is holding your ability to make money as a company. Yeah. Um, and yeah. um, well, that's you know, and try and try and get them to uh, pull pull the money out of other budgets effectively. Yeah. Look, now that that's something you can do, and there, there's a couple of things I just wanted to sort of t I'll touch on today uh, around this because in in the end, sales is is really it's a it's a grey it's not a black and white sport. You you don't close or not close a sale. In a lot of cases, when people say they have to think about it and get back to you, they actually do. Uh, in other cases, uh, you know there are constraints. Uh, your, your job is to play your best game on the day, um, to make sure that you've hit the the, buy, the buying buttons, to, if, if you want to call them that. Because, um, yeah. like you say, uh, often people say we don't have budget for that, but inevitably, if they really, really want it, they can find the budget. Um, so, really, our job as a salesperson is to make sure that when they say they have money, uh, we've actually made sure that we've presented all of the upside, all the benefits, so that. If they see the value in it, they'll go and find the money. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, sort of other than that, they will go into. And I, and I saw your forecast. You've actually done a pretty good job there um, of tracking it. Mm -hmm. um, the the only sort of thing from my perspective was how you how you manage the the, the rolling dates. I noticed you did it like a Gantt chart. 
Um, mm. my, my concern is often with dates like that, they're a bit rubbery because people say, yeah, yeah. look, we're, we're well, pretty... What I do is I, I use that as, uh, as a report out to uh, my directors here mm. on a month-by-month -month basis. So I actually update okay. that on a monthly basis and hand oh, back to great. them so they can see how we're progressing with some of those clients. And you can see, you know, I've got some follow-ups there or I've, I've put in those, you know, it's like next, a month later or two months later, mm. you know, they're, they're in a better position to, um, you know, look at that again, you know, the, the engineering yep. work that we contract with or the service. Yeah. So, so yeah, really, right, it, is, it is time consuming and I, I do need to uh, keep it alive on a month by month basis. Yeah. Look, de definitely important because it just means nothing falls through the cracks. Uh, and oh. being in engineering as you are, you really do need to track these 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 projects to make sure that you're doing the best you can to keep the project alive and moving. Um, some sometimes what I, what I used to do is really um, if if you if you're looking at your sales budget and that's the one thing on there I couldn't really calculate is um, from a sales manager's point of view what I want to know is how many sales are you going to make this month. Yeah. And uh, so I, I usually put the dollars in, um, which mm -hmm. is the value of the project. Um, yeah. I might weight that based on the lot probability of it coming in, and then I'll have a, a date, which is the date I think the project will finalise, or, or we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll win it. Now, those sorts of things are a bit rubbery because you might we, I might be doing a presentation here on some technical things, and you might say, look, this re looks really good, David. Um, we'd like to go ahead with this. We don't have any budget. I come back and see us in August. Um, so to get yeah, well, no, I mean, I mean that's, that's some of those sorts of scenarios, yeah. Yeah. Now, if that happens, right, what, what I would end up doing is I would be putting it in as August um, August wind date, yeah, and yeah. I would adjust the confidence level to a little bit lower, saying that these guys are still in early early phase. And yeah. the reason I want to do that is the weighted figure. It, let, let's say it was a ten thousand dollar deal, and there was a fifty fifty. My confidence was at fifty percent, and the the customer said to me, August, um, that would show up as a weighted figure of half. So it would be 5,000 instead of 10,000. Now, what that sort of alerts me to is if I have a target or if I'm trying to achieve 20,000 in sales in August, um, I'm, I'm short of the mark and there's a couple of ways I can get to the 20,000. Uh, mm -hmm. The first way is to turn it from a 50% to 100%, but that might be outside of my control because of mm -hmm. their constraints, um, in which case I need to go and find some other opportunities. So, so the, the way I use a sales forecast, like the one you've got, is it actually dictates to me as a sales rep where should I focus my energy? Mm. Because in sales, there's, there's generally two places to focus your energy: getting more work into the funnel, or converting the work that's already in the funnel. So this, they're the two areas. Um, now, if there's enough work in the funnel and it can be moved, so um, I think with engineering, it's a bit more constrictive where you can't really get people to make a decision earlier, they're going to follow their, their own process. Um, mm -hmm. Where, for example, with Andrew, he's in the um, solar electricity business. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably a little bit more, uh, less regimented because it's not part of a bigger project in, in general terms. It's a, it's a decision to save money or, or, or to switch. Yeah, we usually struggle with the approval chain. Yeah. 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 So, so, so what it means is that in, in your scenario, I'd probably be looking, okay, so if I can't control these projects because they're actually part of bigger projects, what I'd probably need to do yeah, is get more. <laughs> okay. And, and so then the only thing you can do is you can go the scarcity path, which is where um, when you're talking to someone about doing testing in August, you say, well, at the moment we're available. Um, I've got three or four other projects that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm proposing uh, I'm quoting on at the same time, and it's going to be a first in best dressed scenario. Yes, yeah, they may not get, they may not actually get the service at the time they want. That's right. Uh, it may affect your project. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you're specialised enough, that will work, because they're not going to turn around and say, "Well, that doesn't matter. We'll just find another person." They're saying, "Well, you're the guys we want. It's just a matter of time." So you're putting pressure back on them to get their their house in order as far as their projects go. Okay, so so that's one that's one of the ways that you can sort of keep um, like get those those percentages up as far as confidence goes, and also firming up the dates. So, um, so yeah, so probably what I what I'd consider is with with your sales forecasting, maybe simplify um, how you how you report the numbers, um, and so maybe go back to just those percentage confidence and those deliver and those uh, win dates. Because they they become then the things that I look at at the start of the month, saying is there enough is there enough work in my funnel 
um, to go and improve the conversions and, and maybe start talking to guys about scarcity or lack of resource, or do I need to go and find a few other a few other deals to throw in there? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah no, so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but that, that looks really good. I mean, overall, um, what, what you're doing is great. Um, yours is a bit different because you're in a highly specialised area. Um, the commonalities that I see though is that a deal's a deal, and um, what, what you still need yeah. to consider is that they're a bit more sophisticated, they're a bit more complex. Uh, unfortunately, with yours, there's always going to be a highly specific quote, and you're going to be managing someone else's, uh, like fitting into someone else's project. So that, that's the challenging component of it. Um, on the upside, uh, also makes you a scarce resource. They can't get three quotes for the same thing easily, mm -hmm. uh, which sort of gives you a bit yeah, of yeah, leverage. Okay. Yeah, it, it is a bit like that. Yeah, that, and that's right. And then, you know, we we constantly looking at our own internal capabilities and questioning whether we could, um, you know, modify ourselves internally and give us, you know, give ourselves the flexibility to actually do some of the work and then. And um, you know, develop the proposal and the quotations, and hence that's why it's um, it can be quite a lengthy process um, because mm. you're reviewing your own internal capabilities and then bouncing back with suppliers and uh, solutions. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I suppose the plus side of all that is you can get quite intimate with their project, and because because you're a scarce resource in the project, you can actually influence the project timelines. Um, often, if you're if you're the key, if you're the linchpin to a project, and they're going, well, we need you guys, we need APS to do the testing. They're the only guys we trust. And then you say to them, look, we've got a window opportunity for two months in the middle here, and after that, we're going to get absorbed into a massive project, so we're going to be unavailable. Um, yeah. You can actually sway their timelines on projects based on those sorts yeah. of uh, parameters. So, yeah. so and that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Because we do end up building a, a, a most of these guys when we do. Uh, crack them. Yeah, we do. We do build up an intimate relationship with them. Yeah, uh, and here's the key. So, so w what I'd suggest for you is it's about building that relationship to that point where you actually open. You're, you're open about your availability. And it's genuine because you're right. I, I, you're a pretty small company, so I think when you get absorbed into a big project, that's it. <laughs> it's not like you can say, well, okay, well, we'll squeeze another two projects in once you're once you're in, you're in. So you can use that as a reverse a pressure project. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, um, that, that's good. That's good. Look, uh, I've got a bit that I want to talk about, so I'm just going to switch to some no, slides. Uh, thanks for that, Ivan. Okay, so um, what I wanted to do, let me see if I can get my slideshow working, is let me get this working. Okay. Slojo. Okay. So what we've got up here is uh, th these are the slides you might recognise. This one we talk about um, the formula for change. Now we use this in the sales training, and we really talked about the uh, when when we're selling to a prospect. Um, we've got to overcome their resistance to purchasing our product or service. Uh, I want to use this in a slightly different context today. What I wanted to talk about was how it applies to the individual. Um, there's a term um, called call reluctance or self-sabotage, and I I'm pretty sure every salesperson on the planet is going to experience this one day, and I just thought it was worth addressing um, in today's call. Um, because if we talk about you know dealing with clients, making contact, um, making calls, doing proposals, um, that's all great news, uh, but the, the, there's a variable in there that we've really got to watch, which is our own performance. And if I look at a salesperson's performance, it's generally variable. Uh, most people, um, after we say get a, a series of rejections or we get a series of, um, you know, the, of, of uh, projects that we lose, uh, we lose our motivation or we feel a bit gun shy, so we're not that quick to get out there on the road. Now, we've talked about measuring activity as a way of overcoming that. Um, what we, what I really wanted to cover today is how do we deal with that internal um, self-sabotage or call reluctance as a salesperson? So if we're looking at this formula for change and we apply it to ourselves, uh, what we can do is we can use dissatisfaction and vision within ourselves to set targets. Um, dissatisfaction is obviously not being satisfied with the amount of income or or, or, um, or the amount of commissions that we're generating within the job. Uh, vision is really how much money we can make or setting the targets, which we've been doing in the past weeks. 
And the first steps we've also discussed is getting things like your, you know, your regular calling cycles, your default diary, your activity quotas in place so that we can overcome this internal resistance. But what I really wanted to sort of discuss is where does internal resistance come from? Now, if we look at an iceberg, um, what you'll notice with an iceberg is that 80% you know, of the iceberg is underneath the water. And if we look at what sunk the Titanic, it wasn't the bit above the surface, it was the bit beneath the surface. So it was actually this sort of component of the iceberg that we don't see. Now, if we look at someone's identity, and especially that of a salesperson, we're usually sort of uh, measuring performance on things like um, you know, the actions they take, the decisions they make, and uh, the behavior. So if I start looking at a salesperson's activity quota, or looking at their sales results over the past week or past month, what, what I'm really seeing is a result. And so when we look at that from a perspective of identity, we're looking at the behavior or the tip of the iceberg. So often what we do is if we sort of drill down beneath the surface, the first thing we see beneath the surface of the iceberg is the skills. Now, skills in relation to sales is the things we've been talking about, having sales procedures, having sales process, having questions, having scripts, all of those things that, that, that are prepared for you. But the second component of that is, is really just practicing those skills. So the things we've talked about with role playing and the like. But if we look beneath the skills, there's a thing called beliefs. And what we believe to be true will determine the skills that we acquire and that determines our behavior. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is that when we talk about, when we talk about beliefs, and we covered this a bit in the sales training, we talked about beliefs from the point of view of um, you know, what your beliefs were around sales, your product, um, what your beliefs were around, um, you know, money even. And the reason I brought that up is because our beliefs play a big part in the skills that we'll pick up and our behaviors. So when we talk about sales, I, there's a lot to do with our mindset and our positivity or our ability to basically overcome objections and so forth. Now, if we look beneath beliefs, the next thing after that is values. And values are basically, the, the subtle difference between a belief and a value is a belief is something we hold to be true. Uh, sorry, a belief is something that we believe to be true. And a value is a filter that we use to make decisions through. Now, I'll explain that very briefly. Um, so if, we, if I ask someone what's most important in, in their success or in their business or in their life, they'll generally tell me a value. And they'll come up with things like family or they'll come up with things like health, or they'll come up with things like success or happiness. Now, when I make a statement like happiness, it's not a belief, it's a value. And the reason we call it a value is that when I, when I say, well, what is it? What, what does happiness mean to you? They might say, well, happiness means not stressing at night, having enough money to pay my bills and making sure my kids are brought up all right. Now, still talking about values, we're not talking about beliefs. So if I then said, what's your belief around happiness? Um, people would then come up with a statement and you know the typical ones that I hear is well money doesn't buy your happiness um, and, and you know now what we've done is we've taken a value and we've attached a belief to it and the value is happiness but the belief is that money won't give me happiness now once again neither true or false it's just a belief and we can argue about what's right and what's wrong but the, the truth at the end of the day is if you believe something to be true it is so if we go one step further within this iceberg, we start to see a thing called our identity. Now, the identity is one of the most critical aspects of how we perform, because how we see ourselves will determine our values, beliefs, skills, and behavior. So the two most powerful words in the English language are the words I am. And when we talk about um, what people say after that, that usually determines whether they're going to be successful or not in a particular aspect of their lives or of, of their business. So when someone says, I'm no good at remembering names, um, what they're doing is they're actually created an affirmation. So the word I am is what we use in I am statements or affirmations. And what we want to do is be really weary about what we say. And uh, you know, there's a famous quote that I recall, and it's it went along the lines of what you say to yourself about yourself is what's most important because the self-talk, the things that we say to ourselves will determine our performance, our behaviors, all of those sorts of things. And so be really weary of how you see yourself because sometimes people say, well, I'm not, I'm not that good at sales or, you know, I'm not a great communicator or I'm terrible at networking. And any words that you use to identify yourself, they become pigeonholes. And what we want to be really cautious of is our languaging to ourselves because it actually determines what happens as an outcome. Now, the last thing with this iceberg is it lives in an environment. 
And that environment, in this case, is the ocean. Um, the environment for you as an individual or as a sales rep or as a business owner is the people that you hang around with, it's the employees that you have in your team, it's basically even your office, what's around you in your office. If you've got an office full of junk, uh, generally that will deter, that, that's an environment that will either nurture you or it'll actually cause uh, anxiety or stress. So I bring this up because when we talk about self-management, which is really what the theme of today is about, I want you to consider what are the things around me, what are my surroundings doing for my self-management? What is my environment doing? What discussions am I having with my team members or my employees or even my colleagues, family? Um, because that environment will actually influence my identity, my identity, my values, uh, which in turn then uh, influences my beliefs, what I do, like how much reading I do, whether I watch videos or not, and ultimately my behavior. Now behavior in sales, it's simple. It's measured in, in volumes of sales or, or runs on the board. So um, if we talk about self-sabotage and, and why people stay where they, where they are, the ultimate reason I think that people stay where they are is this one, they suffer from fear. Now, if you go back to when we were cavemen, fear was actually quite important because what it allowed us to do is it allowed us to actually have what was called fight or flight. And fight or flight meant that, uh, you know, if we're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, uh, we'd be able to run as quickly as we could and we could jump substantially high into a tree to get away from the danger. Uh, the problem in today's society is that we don't use fear the way it was intended. The way it was intended was actually to be a response to a threat fight or flight. These days, a lot of people actually live in fear. And the issue with living in fear is that when we live in fear, what happens is that uh, we, we start to get anxiety and stress. And, and like from a sales perspective, living in fear it will actually affect performance. It'll affect the way that you, um, the way that you operate. It'll affect the way that you uh, deliver. I've dropped out, no audio. Let's see what's happened here. No audio? Hello? Can you hear me now? Okay. Something happened to the audio, but we're back. Okay, so when we talk about fear, um, what we have to be really weary of is that people live in fear. And when they live in fear, um, it creates this anxiety and stress. So the, the solution to fear, and if we talk to psychologists, what they suggest is that uh, um, they, just, they, they really realize that fear is something that, that's actually not real. And what I mean by that is if you've ever had this experience where you might have core reluctance or you might be fearful of you know, asking a question or even with a purpose statement. You know, I've had a few people that I've worked with that, which are quite fearful of, um, you know, asking the asking for the sale and we need to be thinking in terms of how real this fear is because if you don't conquer this fear it'll conquer you so one of the secrets to being successful is feeling the fear and doing it anyway there's a great book by that title so i want you to just be to, to be really conscious of whether fear is real or whether fear is just um something that uh, is going on in your mind because typically when we do the thing we fear we find that it's not as hard as, as we thought it was going to be anyway. I just remember when I was younger and we were down at Portsea Back Beach and, and down there there's this little cliff on the side uh, of the beach there and all these little kids were jumping into the water. And so me and me mates, we were down there and uh, you know we all went up to this cliff figuring no problem, we're all going to jump in the water and one by one everyone's jumping in and when it came to my turn and I, I sort of looked over the edge, what I did see was there's a lot of rocks there and you actually had to jump, it wasn't far, it was probably a metre or two out to make sure you cleared the rocks. So all of a sudden, I sort of froze and I wasn't able to jump and all the guys are in the water and they're looking up and I could hear them talking to each other and they're all saying, he's not going. There's no way he's going to jump. And I think bets were being put put down. Um, so after a bit of humiliation, when a little four-year-old kid came screaming out from behind me and jumped off the cliff, I thought, no, nah, I've got to go. Uh, anyone who's been in a situation like that, you know, you know, the first thing that once you've hit the water, the first thing that happens when you bob up is, gee, that was fun. Let's do it again. Now, the same thing happens in sales, the same thing happens in cold calling, the same thing happens in using purpose statements. Anything that you fear, in most cases, once you actually go through that process, um, feel the fear and just move through it, you'll find that all of a sudden it becomes easy. 
you know, we did an interesting experiment a while back and uh, we just, just to sort of test about, like we're testing around self-sabotage and this was an interesting test. We put an ad in the paper for a sales rep. Um, actually, we put two identical ads in the paper. And the only difference between the two ads was one was um, one had the um, on-target earnings OTE at fifty thousand, and the other one had the same exact same wording, other than the OTE, which was at two hundred and fifty thousand. Now, when we started this test, we just wanted to see what would happen, and as you can imagine, we got much greater response to one ad than the other. Now, when I ask people which one they think, it's usually a mixed response. Um, but the, the, the results of this test, what we found is that we actually had um, 10 times more response to the ad for 50,000 a year than 250,000 a year. Now, if you think about why that happens, okay, um, people go, well, that's obvious, right? Because the $50,000 a year job is way, way easier than the 250,000 a year job. Um, and, and, and my question is, how? How can you even tell that? Uh, and the answer usually was, well, of course it's going to be easier because it pays less. So this, this underlying assumption or belief that when we have a dollar amount attached to a job, that that dictates how difficult the job's gonna be. Now, the similar thing happens when you go and select a wine. Unless you're a wine connoisseur, most people will select wine based on the actual dollar value or the price. And uh, it's an interesting way of judging, but unless you know your wines or unless you know your regions, you're sort of guessing until you pop the bottle open and have a taste of it. So, you know, th this scenario, in sales was what we know self, as self-sabotage. Now, the irony of this whole experiment is that if you think about how much harder someone has to work in one job versus the other, um, typically speaking, the $50,000 a year guy is working way, way harder on transactional activities than the guy at 250,000. The big difference is the person who believes they're worth 250,000 works at a totally different level. So they're looking for bigger results, bigger, bigger sales and um, so they're generally working at strategy rather than tactic. So why do people always go for the 50,000? Well, it's their comfort zone because if you're used to earning 50,000 or if you feel 50,000 um, suits your identity, so if you see yourself as a 50 grand a year sales rep, you'll gravitate towards the 50. And if someone suggested to you, why don't you go for the 250 job, the first thing you'd say is I've never earned that much money or uh, I'm not really sure what's involved. Now, reading the words in the, in, in the ad, it's exactly the same job. But these little things that occur, our own self biases will dictate what we believe is, is going on behind the scenes of this job and it was purely based on the dollar amount. So if you think about why people stay where they're at, they are, typically it's because they're comfortable at that level. And what you wanna do is you really wanna start looking at yourself and what your comfort level is and what your tolerance level for income is and just seeing how, how comfortable you really are there and whether you're just doing self-sabotage or not. There's this formula for life success. Now, some of you may have seen this before and I just wanted to cover this pretty quickly. It's called the be, do, have formula. And if we think about what this is about, um, normally when we set goals, we set sales targets, we're talking about what we wanna have, right? What is the end result? And it usually comes down to a commission or an income. Now, you'll notice that there's three words here. There's the word be, the word do, the word have. Now, I like to look at these as a formula and say, well, you know, if we look at the goals or the results we're getting in life, what we have in life, it's going to be a direct reflection of the things we do and who we are or who, uh, uh, who we be, right? So what we think about is, well, each one of these activities, like what we do is purely activity based. So the reason I turn it into a formula is that if we turn around to a sales rep and say, you're going to work twice as hard. So what we do is we double the amount that they do but we don't change their identity as a salesperson, who they be. The problem with that is zero times 100 is zero. So sometimes you'll see people who are working really hard, extra hard just to try and achieve a result, but they're going nowhere. They're spinning their wheels. And one of the reasons they're doing that is that they're working on their activities, but they're not working on themselves. Now, the other side of this is true as well. If we work on ourselves, so we're reading books, we're going to seminars, we're watching videos online, and we're really educating, taking notes, and we're working on the B, but we don't change the level of activity or the kind of activity that we do. So 100 times zero is still zero. So the results are not forthcoming. Now, the reason this is so significant is if you ever look at your goals and you say, I'm not achieving the goals that I'm setting, and you ask the question, why am I not achieving the goals that I'm setting? You'll find it's gonna be one of two areas. You're either 
not doing the right activities or you're not well, you, you haven't improved or moved yourself so the example of this that I often use is that if someone wins the lottery you know and, and this is quite a, a common common knowledge uh, the typical statistics on someone winning touch lotto is within two years they're going to lose all the money not only do they lose all that money they're probably going to lose a bit more and a few relationships along the way now the reasoning behind that and it's not everybody it's the old 80 20 rule the reasoning behind that is if someone's never had a million dollars in their life and really doesn't know what to do with it, and all of a sudden I hand them over a check for a million, um, all of a sudden they're in a new world because now they're trying to work out what do I do with this money. Now, some people are smart about it and they go and invest, um, but the reality is they've got no experience investing. So how do they invest? Well, they go and speak to either an investment advisor or they go straight to the bank and they pop it in the account. But because they've got no experience, so they've never been a millionaire before, they don't know what millionaires do. Now, if we look at the formula, the formula states that if I have a million, but I don't know how to be a millionaire, or I don't know what to do with the money, I'm going to lose it. So it's interesting when we look at that and the reverse is true. So if I give someone a million dollars and they don't know how to be a millionaire and they don't know what to do with it, they're going to lose it. So if I want to make a million dollars, I can do that without getting the money. All I need to do is act like a millionaire and do what millionaires do. And this is why we talk about reading and education and immersion in, in, in these books about uh, mentors and leaders. Because when you start to think like a millionaire and when you start doing what millionaires do, you'll find that the money in the bank account starts to increase. So this formula is quite significant. Now, if you try, if you sort of look at this, it's quite sort of esoteric and hard to establish. But if we look at it from a slightly different point of view, people do what they're good at or they do what they are today. So if we look at someone's activity, it's usually a good, in, it's a good indication of what their skill sets are. And what we can control is the things we think about. So when we, when we sort of talk about watching these videos and reading these books, and you know, we, I would suggest that you go beyond just the, the sales books. What I'd suggest is you also start looking at things on personal development, on psychology, on wealth creation, because the more you think differently, then you'll change who you are, which will change the activities you do as well. Now, the last thing I wanted to cover on this is what happens when we apply pressure to someone. And I'm just gonna see if I can change. Um, yeah, we're back. Um, when, when we apply pressure to ourselves, now, this is, this is a terminology. There was, a, there was a, a fellow who won the Nobel Prize on, on a study into this, and it's, it's, his name was Ilya Prigogine. And what he determined is that in nature, when, when a tree falls down in the forest, it does one of two things. It either decays on the forest floor and it breaks down, so it atrophies, or it does the reverse. It actually fossilizes, which means it gets buried over thousands of years and it turns from wood into coal. And if we keep fossilizing over another few thousand years, it turns from coal into diamond. So he said, you know, there's two things that happens to this piece of wood. It either breaks down um, or it becomes stronger. It turns into a harder substance. Now, the same happens within human nature. And when we put, apply pressure to someone, and especially someone in a sales role, and, and so if we think about what happens is when we set a budget for ourselves or we set some targets, that pressure will actually cause you to either lose sleep at night or it'll cause you to act in a different way. Now, there's two ways to actually get out of this pressure. One way is to back out, but basically justify why you didn't make your target. The other way is to actually use the pressure to have a breakthrough. Now, if we talk about what happens is when we apply enough pressure to someone and they don't sort of back out of the pressure, they're gonna have a breakthrough. Just imagine I get a pot of water and I stick it on the stove and I turn the heat up. Now, not much happens until that water hits boiling point, at which point all of a sudden those little bubbles on the side just start going crazy and the water starts going to, into this, this profuse bubbling as it's changing state from liquid to vapor. Now, that's how, that's how state change happens in nature. If we think about what happens with humans, when we apply pressure to a human and they're about to pop or they're about to boil, then their emotions come out. Now, sometimes emotions are going to be uh, crying. Sometimes emotions are just going to be, you know, it, it's all different for different people. Sometimes it's nerves. When we get someone who's in sales and we get them to sort of ask questions where they've never asked questions before, they get anxious. And that's pressure being, being applied. Now, the reason we want to apply this pressure is if we have the breakthrough um, and we come out the other side, we usually come out stronger. So we, we sort of move forward in our lives. So if you get good at using your purpose or positioning statement, you'll find you'll never go back. 
because once you start using it, you go, actually, this is pretty cool. And uh, it actually gives me control of the sale. When we learn to ask good sales questions and we find that they actually help us close the sale, we'll never go back as well. So th this whole, this whole um, sort of process is known as perturbation and it comes from the word perturbed. And perturbed means to ruffle up. Now, the reason I bring it up is because as a salesperson, inevitably you're going to hit a wall. And as you hit that wall, what you do will determine whether you have success or failure. And success means that you have a breakthrough. And a breakthrough might mean that you have a breakdown, a break up, a break apart, or a break with. Now, any of these things usually are breaks with your history, breaks with your old mode of operation, breaks with your old belief system, and might be breaks from, from the place you're working. But what you want to be weary of with this whole terminology of perturbation is when you apply pressure to yourself or when you have pressure applied to you, you get to choose what happens with that pressure. Now, some people don't don't rest with it very well. And this is what causes that whole um, anxiety thing is when we live under pressure, but we don't act on the pressure. So I want you to think in terms of pressure is good if you utilize it to grow. Pressure is not good if you just let it hang over your head. And I'm bringing this up because I just want you to be weary of um, of what happens, you know, when we do apply this pressure. Because inevitably, as a sales rep, you're going to be sort of put under the gun and you're going to be looking at your own self-sabotage and your ability to manage. So what, what I'd like you to do, and, and we're sort of coming to the end of the call, is you know a little bit of homework for, for this week. Um, is We just want to think about what are those pressure points? What are those breakthrough moments? That we, or where are we self-sabotaging within our sales process? Because if you think about where you're self-sabotaging and you identify ways to eliminate it, you're going to have major, major changes in the way that you operate because it's all about confidence and you know confidence sells. So, so the homework for this week is really to start identifying where are those points of pressure, or points of perturbation within, your, within, within yourself, um, where are the weaknesses in your process or in your mode of operation or in your, in your, in your own skill sets and identifying what they are so we can put a plan of action together so that we can start working with, uh, with those sort of areas and improving those to improve your overall performance. Um, and other than that, what we're going to do is it, I did promise we'd do some role playing this week on questions. We're going to roll that into the next week's session because we've just run out of time. Um, and, but we're just going to keep it focused, right? So your job over the next week is really simple. We're going to make sure that we're going to go through some role playing on questions next week. I also want you to just think in terms of where are you self-sabotaging? Where are these fears? Where are these anxieties? Where, where are you finding that the pressure is actually not not helping you move forward so where are those points of perturbation what do we need to do to get you to the next level i'm going to leave you at that end uh thank you for your time this morning guys and we'll catch up with you same time next week have a great week